Welcome back to Master the Marketplace with Caspian. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Master the Marketplace with Caspian. Today, we have a special guest on the show, Addy, who's the co-founder of Amerilis Payments. And I'd love for him to really tell us a little bit about his company. So, Adi, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your company? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Kunal. Uh, so, my name is Adi Eckstein. I uh, started uh, my career in payments 20 years ago. Uh, my first job straight out of college during the dot-com boom back then. I was part of a very small team that invented mobile payments which was the precursor to what you know today as Apple Pay and Google Pay. And back then, um, I don't know if you remember what kind of phone you had back then, but we we're talking about phones, flip phones, uh, Motorola StarTech or uh, versions of Nokia, if anyone remember. So definitely no smartphones, uh, no apps, uh, not even an app store. And we found a way to put an app on those phones. Uh, actually, we put it on the SIM card of the phone, of the mobile phone. And then we partnered with uh, Orange Telecom and we deployed a commercial solution where people could go uh, to a grocery store, a restaurant, a pharmacy and pay for the goods with their phone. So that's how I started. And from there, I went on to design numerous payment systems, won a number of awards, one of them from uh, Steve Ballmer, then uh, CEO of Microsoft, and another one for the best subscription billing system in the industry. And that's how I started, yes. <laughs> that's fast. fantastic. And then what got you to, to Amerilis? And tell us a little bit about the company and you know what you folks do. Yeah, absolutely. So Amaryllis is a cloud-based platform that let companies embed payments, monetize payment, and really become payment facilitators. And the reason we started the company is that we noticed a pattern in the market uh, where companies kept building the same payment system in-house over and over again. Uh, you know, unlike, uh, uh, for example, CRM software, you wouldn't build your own CRM software these days. You're just going to go and procure or buy ready-made software. Uh, so we decided to take all our knowledge, know-how and expertise and mold it into a technology stack that others can use so they don't need to reinvent the payment wheel. And that's a more release. And really, it's a cloud-based platform, mostly suitable for marketplaces, enterprises, or well-funded startups that need a shortcut to this market. And they can operate in almost any industry. We have clients in e-commerce, retail, grocery delivery, ticketing, travel, many more. Fantastic. I mean, that's apt for our conversation today because, you know, a lot of the focus on this podcast is marketplaces. And, you know, we talk about how brands can scale their businesses on different marketplaces and, you know, an integration with payments is sort of very critical as, as part of the overall marketplace ecosystem. So, you know, maybe a question for you in terms of just, you know, this past year, which has been, you know, different when it comes to a typical year in the retail world, a lot of shopping has been online, people are working from home. How have you seen the payments landscape evolve as the shift has taken to more online? Like what, is, what has been your experience and what you're seeing out there, what you have seen out there? Yeah, so definitely we've seen tremendous shift in, uh, shift in the industry. Just like you said, there was a shift from brick and mortar to online. That was the obvious shift boosted by the pandemic. Uh, we also saw a shift to omni-channel, for example, purchase online and pick up in store. Uh, online grocery deliveries, and we can touch on omni-channel payments um, uh, later. Uh, I think we saw some less sensitivity for price over the ease of purchase and speed of delivery, uh, at least in the beginning, and that still carry over uh, till today, almost a year, uh, uh, almost a year later. Uh, we also saw a tremendous shift of direct to consumer. 
Uh, if you remember during the pandemic, when Amazon stopped accepting non-essential products into its warehouses, and for good reasons, mm -hmm. uh, retailers realized that they cannot take and fulfill orders. Um, and then they started migrating to other platform, namely Shopify. Uh, and it looks like this trend is here to stay and retailers and brands will continue maintaining this direct, direct to consumer channel uh, so that's for sure here to stay. Um, other trends I notice is the pressure of free shipping. Uh, consumers got spoiled with Amazon, obviously. So the question of retailers and merchants is, can their model support and sustain free shipping? That's a good question. Uh, and we also saw that customer acquisition costs uh, are much higher, including cost of advertisements. Uh, we saw a spike uh, early in November, right before Thanksgiving and into December in Google advertisement. And definitely Facebook ads are uh, almost back to their peak in the pandemic. So that's also, also a shift. Um, other things that I mention, can mention is some booming industries. Uh, definitely online education and online courses. And the entire ecosystem uh, that went parabolic with the pandemic, everything that the tools that help you produce courses, obviously online education or online course marketplaces that popped up. Uh, and then the entire uh, ecosystem of uh, subscription management, marketing and so forth. And other industries, everything that has to do with side hustles, uh, obviously the B2B work from home industry, the Zoom, uh, Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams and the like. And of course, also exercise at home, Peloton and other innovators uh, that provide the uh, train at home services. So yeah, these are the major shifts that, that I noticed in the market in the last year or so. That's awesome. Yeah, very comprehensive. And do you think that these shifts that have happened in the last year, will they continue? Or do you think that we will revert back to some normal or maybe this is the new normal? What are your, what's your opinion there? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's almost the new normal. Time will tell. I don't think we are we are out of the woods yet. So there is still a, we still need some time to see. But most of the things that I just mentioned are are for sure going to be here for, for the next little while, if not for good. Uh, people are going to train more at home going forward. They are, they are now used to ordering things online that they didn't order before. Uh, online groceries is a great example, either ship directly to your door or uh, pick up at store, uh, but not going in and picking up your groceries like you used before. That's, that's here to stay. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I like to do typically to try to understand, you know, trends is I like to see what startups are working on. And I like to go to, you know, Y Combinator and I like to go to C in some of these accelerators and see, you know, what are they funding? And believe it or not, all the items that you mentioned are areas that they are funding right now. So, you know, and it, it's, again, an indication that, you know, that's where the venture capital in industry thinks also where the industry is going to go. And that's why they're funding some of these startups to facilitate all these areas that, that you, that you mentioned are new trends in this industry. But you picked on, you picked on one important area that I think is very relevant, which is omni-channel. And like talk a little more about, you know, omni-channel and specifically how will the payments landscape change as we see more brands looking at a omni-channel like approach to sell online? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's just uh, uh, speak about omni-channel, especially when it pertains to to payment, so the audience can understand. So uh, before omni-channel, there was single channel, which basically meant that you transact with consumers via one payment channel only, either retail or online, but only one. Uh, the next step in the evolution was multi-channel where you had multiple channels to transact with consumers, but they were, they were very siloed with very little interaction with one another. So you had a store, then you had a website, but the interaction with the store was only in the store and the interaction with the website was only in the website. 
And then omnichannel is really at the top of that pyramid where you now join these multiple channels uh, to work together to enable enhance experience and interactions. Um, so that's really omnichannel uh, in the way that we speak about. Um, and I would say there are three things you need to pay attention to, especially where it pertains to payments and omnichannel. Um, first is that you need to leverage technology to deliver your omnichannel vision. Uh, omnichannel payment processing requires flexible payment engines that can support all type of variations of transactions and you need to have that. Um, number two is that the consumer doesn't really care about the integration behind the scene and all the complexity that is that is involved. And uh, number three is that probably the most important thing is data synchronization. And I'll give a, a couple of examples for scenarios. So you need to synchronize data in between those channels to support different use cases. One, one typical use case is buy online, return in store, uh, Boris uh, in short. So, so there are questions like, uh, do returns showing online under my account, for example, or when you go, when a consumer go to a store and show up the email they received from the online purchase to pick up, can you use that order number in your in-store uh, system to look up the sale? So that's Boris. Uh, there is another scenario called buy online pickup in store, BOPIS in short. So again, can you provide same day pickup? So I just bought something. I want to rush and go get it. Is it available? There are the system connected to tell everybody that I can pick it up. And also when I do show up in store, can you convert that online purchase into a card present transaction? Now I'm in store, I have the card at hand. Uh, can you take my payment? You're going to pay less fees if you do, but can you do that? Can your system support that? Um, and then, of course, there is all the refunds and chargebacks. Can you refund to a different payment instrument? I bought with one card. I'm showing up with a different one. Can you do that? Can you tokenize the cards across all your channels so I can have a unified experience? Uh, and then, of course, everything that has to do with payable and in inventory management. Can you take a sophisticated transaction that happens online or in an app that involves split fees where I'm paying for groceries, but behind the scenes, there is a fee to a delivery company, uh, for example. Can you convert that also if I'm showing up and paying with my car present at your store? So these are really the challenges that we see with Omnichannel that retailers need to pay attention to. And to support all these use cases, I mean, is Amerilis, for example, a company or similar companies that provide a one-stop shop to be able to manage all of these? Yeah, so there, there are definitely companies and providers out there that do that. Amarillis is definitely one of them. And uh, we also support a model called payment facilitation that is up and coming, especially in the pandemic. So we can speak about that as well. Yeah, let's, I mean, let's jump into that. I'd love to learn more about, you know, what payment facilitation specifically is. And, you know, I mean, educate me. I'm not a payments guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so payment, uh, a payment facilitator uh, or pay in short, mm -hmm. uh, is really a company that provides mini payment processing services, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So they get the permission from a real payment processor to accept payments on behalf of their merchants. Um, in that process, they get to decide who they're going to do business with so they can sign up their merchants very quickly and charge a fee for each transaction running through their system. So that, that's the definition. And if we want to take a, a, a look at example, two good, very good examples are MindBody and Shopify. So MindBody, as you know, provides software to manage fitness, wellness, and beauty services to over 50,000 merchants. And Shopify uh, is an e-commerce platform that powers online stores for maybe millions of businesses. So if we look at them, the interesting thing is that both of these companies, after they started facilitating the payment of their customers, a large portion of their revenue comes from payment monetization, not from the sales sales of their software. Um, so if we're talking about the benefits of payment facilitation, this is definitely one of them. Uh, other benefits are 
Uh, first, you create a new revenue stream, a, a, a new payment facilitator. You get to tap to and charge a margin, a fee on all payments of all merchants under, under your platform. So, so that's a given. Uh, second is that you speed up your merchant onboarding, and that's very important, especially for marketplaces. Because today, if your platform enables payments for your merchants or the website or the stores, you either have to send the merchant to a third-party payment processor to apply for what's called a merchant account, or you need to collect all that information and pass it along to the uh, payment processor. And that includes a lot of sensitive information like social security number, bank account details, and so forth. So this process takes time, sometimes days, even week. Um, so obviously you can provide a much better experience to your merchant when you become the payment facilitator and with the help of software tools like Amaryllis, uh, you can onboard your customers almost instantly. I see. Interesting. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very interesting and fascinating how this space has really just evolved as trends continue to evolve in this space. So one of the questions that I had was around, you know, as we see again, more support for omni-channel, all the scenarios around Boris, Bopis that, that you talked about, as those become more mainstream, how does internal operations for a company have to evolve? And you know, how, for I'll give you a very simple example. In the tr traditional retail world, you have one manager managing the Amazon channel, you have someone managing a managing a the Walmart channel, someone's managing true wholesale brick and mortar. And those divisions don't really talk to each other. Reconciliation has to happen across the board. And, and so how does, how does the internal operations of a company need to change or evolve as we see the shift to more omni-channel like experiences? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, uh, uh, number one, you need to uh, bring in knowledge and create specificity. Uh, so, so the same person who used to only do Amazon, just like you say, can now also uh, do Shopify in tandem. At some point, and that's probably a question of scale, you'll need more than one person to, to handle on that. And then the other thing, just like you mentioned earlier about innovation, there are probably going to be more tools and innovative software that let you merge those channels together, at least in a platform that let you manage them more easily. We already see that with for restaurants, uh, they have different delivery companies coming up, DoorDash and so forth. And there are now companies who are providing a software that merges all those channels and let you streamline the order process. I see. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, with any shift in, in technology, with any shift in trends, you know, it's so important for companies to also adapt internally. And so there's this alignment across what's happening externally and, and internally, and that's lock and step together. So I think it's important, at least for folks listening to this, is you know to be open to change internal operations too, to adapt to a changing competitive landscape as a whole. So, so I think one question around just the future of payments, so I'd love to get your opinion on this. Like, how do you see blockchain and like some of these technologies, you know, impacting this space and specifically payment you know, providers like yourselves, like where do you see that technology fit in? We're hearing so much about it, but I'd love to see if there's any practical applications in, in your world. Uh, so I assume you're talking about uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, Bitcoin or, or even the use of blockchain within the payment ecosystem as a whole. But yeah, Bitcoin for sure. Yeah, uh, so definitely Bitcoin and the blockchain chain technology, uh, uh, it's a trend and a hype that a lot of companies are still trying to figure out what can they do with it. Um, so, so that's number one. Number two, blockchain, it's a payment instrument. I think with the adoption, it's going to become more available. More people are going to own Bitcoins and more people are going to uh, want to use it when they shop, especially online. Uh, so I think we're going to see it more available. I'm not sure it can uh, 
uh, give a good fight to credit card. <laughs> it's not gonna uh, credit card. It's it's still the killer payment uh, method out there. Uh, but maybe in some niches uh, or some form of application, blockchain uh, can become more dominant. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a valid view. I mean, till you see consumer behavior change from the perspective of people are actually using Bitcoin to make purchases online or, or wherever, you know, that's a different dynamic versus it being used as a trading instrument or something, you know, these days. And, and, and so will the consumer behavior change in terms of using Bitcoin as currency relative to credit cards? That is probably the most active instrument right now and, you know, hard to replace is, is sort of key, the key point here. Yeah, and and that's right. Uh, looking at Bitcoin as a currency, it's a very volatile currency. So if you go and shop online with your US dollars, the price is the price. Uh, if you come with Bitcoin, the price can be different in the morning than in the afternoon by 10 or 20 percent on some days. So that's something that consumers definitely pay attention to. Exactly, exactly. So I let's touch a little bit upon international. You know, I mean, a big trend we are seeing again from a consumer perspective is, you know, more global marketplace like support, you know, so brands that, that we support, for example, in the U S there's demand for those brands in the UK, the demand for those brands in, in parts of Asia. And I know Amazon keeps talking about a more global like marketplace, as opposed to trying to separate manage all these different countries separately. How do you see the payments landscape evolve globally? And, and, you know, just over time, as we see more globalization, more in, a more integrated world happening. Yeah, so I think it's still complicated to go global, even for big companies. Uh, and the farthest you go, the more complicated, complicated it gets. Um, in some jurisdictions, you still need a locally domiciled entity in order to accept payments. Um, and so there are a number of services out there that let you go global and stay local, but obviously for a fee. Uh, so there is definitely, that's one area I'm still looking for innovation. And maybe that's one area where a marketplace give, give a big benefit to their merchants. So a merchant that sign up with a marketplace and then the marketplace take care of that. You mentioned Amazon and the kind and take care of the fulfillment and shipment worldwide taxes, how do you take payments in Singapore versus Portugal and so forth, kind of mask those problems. Of course, there is a price for that, but it definitely makes things simple for merchants. And does the Amerilis platform support a more global company? If a company wants to operate in multiple countries, will you be able to integrate in a more global structure? Yeah, definitely. So one of our advantages is that we are processor and acquirer agnostic, so we can work with any payment processor worldwide. Uh, and typically, uh, when clients come to us, they can point out in the direction and say, hey, we not only want to work in Singapore, but we want to work with bank A and not bank B. And just like that in any country. And we take care of the technological integration and how to accept payments. Uh, and make it simple for them. Yeah. Great. So Adia, this is a more of a personal question on your company. I noticed on your website, I think you folks were in the City Accelerator. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. A number of years ago. <laughs> so I'd love to, so tell me a little bit about that process. How was it going through, you know, just that startup phase, getting into an accelerator, growing your company? I think there are many entrepreneurs who also listen to our, to our podcast who are Amazon entrepreneurs mostly, you know, but would love to hear from your entrepreneurial side of that journey and how, how has that been? Yeah, uh, so uh, my uh, my co-founder, Ori Hay, he was managing that process, uh, working with the City Accelerator. We had great relationship with the people there. We got into that class of companies. Uh, I think uh, an accelerator is a very good approach to uh, to get you focused in a very short time on what you need to achieve and get results. 
And we definitely got that from City. And definitely when you work with the accelerator, accelerator that is managed by City or other large organization, you get um, other benefits like uh, meeting annoying people worldwide. City is an organization that uh, that works everywhere. Uh, you get a lot of PR and media attention. So you can definitely um, uh, use that benefit to then, when you uh, grow out of the accelerator, use that in order to go to market much faster and much better. That's great, that's great. And how is the how has that startup phase evolved into now running a you know bigger organization, potentially, you know, you in a more mature organization? Has the challenges has been, has it been more difficult? Has it been easier now? Like what, how has that evolution been for you and, and your co-founder as leaders? Yeah, it never gets easier. Uh, it, it's more a question of scale. We definitely grew up since we have about 50 people just in our uh, IT department, building software, testing it, uh, getting releases to market. Um, we're, dif we're dealing with different scale with a lot more customers. Uh, customers from different realms of the market. Uh, so we grew up since then. Uh, when you're a startup, you, you focus on uh, many things, but, uh, but in a more narrow manner. And now when you're a more mature company, you need to take care of business in a more professional way. And that's where we are today. Great, great, great. So yeah, going back to kind of our, our core topic on payments, you know, one of the issues I know we have always faced here at, at Caspian is just our our finance teams internally trying to manage, you know, reconciliation with with Amazon, reconciliation with Walmart, and, and so how does a platform like Amaryllis make it a lot more easier to support internal finance teams to just in in terms of efficiency, in terms of quality, in terms of maybe speed speed to completion? Like, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, so you mentioned reconciliation. So uh, as a definition, reconciliation is the process of matching the sales activity from your own platform, maybe with different channels, with the transaction activity you conducted with the payment process or the platform that accept payments on your behalf, and then reconcile all that with the funds that you actually get in your bank account. Uh, and that has always been a pain point in the industry for, for a couple of reasons. One is that the statements or information that you receive from your payment process or your platform are very hard to reconcile back against the funds that you get in the bank account. There are always additional fees. They may put the chargebacks and deduct them from the number so it doesn't match as the sales anymore. There are a lot of cha challenges there. Uh, and also, if there is any mismatches between your platform and the processor, uh, you'll typically have to detect them on your own. So as an example, sometimes there are technical glitches and there is something called duplicate transaction where a consumer press the buy button now, but for uh, some reason along the way, they got charged twice. Uh, typically, uh, the payment processor or the platform will not notify you on that. It's up to you to detect that. And what happens in, in real life is that typically you'll get the phone call from your customer telling you they got charged twice, and that's a little bit too late. It's not a good customer support. And some of them will not call you. They'll call the credit card issuer and issue a chargeback, with, which is the last thing that you want uh, to have. Um, so definitely platform like ours, like Amaryllis, we automate all that for our merchants. We reconcile all the transactions and we also alert them in real time if something happens. So they get a message right away that tells them this customer got charged twice within two seconds, same amount, same uh, shopping card. You may want to take a look at that to see it wasn't a problem. And within two minutes, they can solve the problem. They can even, with our help, uh, press a button and not charge the consumer the second charge. So it will never appear on the card. They will not even be aware that there was ever a problem. So we have a lot of tools and processes that we build over the years to first monitor for all these anomalies, and then when they happen, alert on that in real time, and then also solve the problem in real time. And related to, to this conversation, what's your view on 
you know, artificial intelligence and data science and its applications to the payments space as a whole? Like, where do you see that space getting evolved? Yeah, I think uh, art AI or artificial right. intelligence, which is another hype right now, I <laughs> think it has a, it has a place in this industry. Uh, again, just like bitcoins, a lot of companies out there are still trying to figure out what they can do with it, and a lot of the solutions we see are uh, are not AI powered; they are uh, uh, human logic powered. At the end of the day, but AI uh, AI has. Um, can make a lot of impact, just as an example. And this is something we did already in 2005, running algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms that look at your entire data set and find, for example, uh, the fact that when you ship to a certain zip code in Ireland and the premise was that the shipment will arrive in five days, if those shipments are out on Mondays, it takes 10 days. And if they're out on Tuesday, it takes 15 days, for example. So algorithms can find these anomalies that you can then look at and take action. So you can improve your shipment in certain part of Ireland, Ireland for example. Or you can see another example, uh, certain uh, cards declined when people try to make certain kind of payments. So most normally everything is smooth, but uh, cards that are issued by a certain bank and the shopping card basket is about $50 and the purchase take place between 10 and 11 uh, in the evening, instead of 90% approval rate, it can drop to 80%, that 10% uh, decline. So things like that, definitely AI can tap into and get us information that we can't normally see today. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, there's, AI is one of those areas where you know, there's certainly a lot of hype and certainly a lot of applications that, that we see and but the industry as a whole is trying to figure out larger organizations trying to figure out how do they integrate AI into their operations startups trying to figure out how do you build an AI first company so there's 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 certainly opportunity and the applications seem seem like they all make sense and and I think you're right in just saying that everyone's trying to figure out how do we best utilize you know, some of the opportunities that AI presents to us. Fantastic. Well, I think this was a fantastic conversation. I know I learned a lot. Uh, you know, if folks listening to us on, on the call right now, if they want to get in touch with you and your company to, you know, to work with Amaryllis, what's the best way that they should do so? Yeah, so they can all head over to our website at amaryllispay.com fill up a short form, we'll get in touch with them right away. I'm uh, mostly active on LinkedIn. You can connect with me there. Just search for Adi Eckstein, A-D-I-E-K-S-H-T-A-I-N, uh, or follow me on Twitter at uh, A-D-I-E-P. Fantastic. Well, Adi, thank you again for this conversation. I certainly appreciate it. And thank you again, everyone, for a one another episode with the Master of the Marketplace and we will see you again very soon next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Through conversations with experts in online retail, with years of marketing, compliance and inventory management experience, we seek to empower our listeners to master the marketplace. Thanks for listening. We hope to see you next time on Master the Marketplace with Caspian.